So that brings me to validity. Um, and again, I went over those three parts of an argument so that we can understand correctly how to use the term validity. So, um, sentences or one way to put this differently is premises or statements or propositions are themselves true or false. So when I say uh, human beings are mortal, that sentence, that statement is either true or false. Sentences are not valid or invalid. And sentences are not sound or unsound. Um, arguments are valid or invalid sound or unsound unsound arguments are not true or false so the way to think about validity and soundness is their properties of arguments and keeping these terms straight is very helpful so what is validity well validity is a property of deductive arguments there's no sort of in between a, a deductive argument is either valid or invalid and the way I like to define validity is an argument is valid if in any situation in which the premises are true, the conclusion is also true. Okay, so it's this relationship that if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. That's validity. Another way to put this is an argument is valid if and only if it is not possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So one thing that I ask myself about an argument to find out whether it's valid or not is that if I, I ask myself, is it possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false? If that possibility exists, it's not a valid argument. Right? So in a way, uh, validity is specifically about that support relationship between premises and conclusion. So some I like to represent things a little bit more visually. Validity and soundness, what is the relationship between them? So um, imagine all the valid arguments are in that blue circle. All the invalid arguments are out. <laughs> and inside here we have arguments that are sound. So there, so it's possible that an argument is valid, but not sound. And it's not possible that an argument is sound, but not valid, right? Because soundness is contained wholly within the valid circle. So what is soundness? Soundness is validity plus truth. So validity is that property that if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true or there's no way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the premises are true. It just means that we're not going from truth to falsity. So um, we'll kind of keep working on that, but right. So no invalid argument can be sound, right? They're way out here. They don't have any relationship to soundness. And a sound argument is necessarily valid, right? It's contained within the circle. There are valid arguments that are unsound because they have false premises. Now, keep in mind that validity is kind of a negative definition. It's saying we're not going from true premises to a false conclusion. But a valid argument could go from false premises to false conclusion because well, because it's not going from true to false. Okay, a couple things here when we're getting into um, some sample deductive patterns. So the arrow, if P then Q, is what's called a material conditional, or it's called other things in other places, but it means if then, okay? So if P, then Q. On the left side of the arrow is the antecedent. So the way I like to think about that is a kind of antecedent condition. So we're not saying it's happening, 
we're saying it's triggered if it happens. So if P happens, Q is guaranteed. On the right side of the arrow is the consequent, which results from the antecedent condition coming into existence. Now, the number one issue that I see with material conditionals is when people go the wrong way up the arrow. So they go, oh, I have Q, so then I must be able to get P. No, it's only if P, then Q. So that's why I like to introduce the terms antecedent and the consequent. So if it rains, then the streets are wet, right? But, you know, we're saying that, that's, that the streets are wet if it rains. So the rain determines the consequent. Okay, so a common form of valid argument. Okay, so I just kind of gave it in already, but modus ponens is very important um, as an argument form. So it basically says, if P then Q, that's like premise number one. So we're, we're stating it. Remember, if the premises, then the conclusion. So we're assuming these things. If P, then Q. Then we're, premise two is P. So P actually happens. That's premise two. And then we're able to derive Q. And it's a valid argument form. Why? Because if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. So let's look at some examples of modus ponens. <sighs> if Nancy goes to the party, then Sid goes to the party. If P, then Q. Or maybe let's draw that. If P, then Q. Here's P, Nancy does go to the party, then Q. And notice we have the, right? But it is a modus ponens form. If P, then Q. Nancy does go to the party, P. Therefore, conclusion to the whole thing, Sid goes to the party, okay? Um, if I go to university, I will learn philosophy. <laughs> if P, then Q. I go to university, P, then Q. Now, as I suggested earlier, um, the order of these premises and these parts of the premises is crucial. We don't want to go the wrong way up the arrow, and we want to make sure that we're paying attention to triggering the antecedent condition. So uh, if I go to university, P, I will learn philosophy, Q. I go to university, triggers P, premise one, combining premise one and premise two, we are able to force the conclusion. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion is also true. But keep in mind, we don't know if this is sound, right? The soundness of this is dependent on the truth of the actual claims. This is what makes this a deductive argument. Because um, if we just look at the form, what's given to us, it's valid. If we want to find out if it's sound, we have to look at the truth. Um, you know, this one is true, I guess, for me. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Let's just uh, exit that and go to the next slide. Modus tollens. So modus tollens looks a little bit more, a little bit different, and um, it might seem like I'm contradicting myself because modus tollens somewhat seems to go the wrong way up the arrow. But keep in mind, it's it's doing it with a not. Okay, so if p, then q but it's actually saying not Q. And so the combination of those two premises, we are able to derive validly not P. So let's look at an example. If we live in Toronto, oh, I like to draw this one. 
Um, okay, let's imagine this is Ontario. Oh. <laughs> then this is Toronto. This is not to scale. <laughs> um, so then if we live in Toronto, P, then we live in Ontario, Q, not Q, therefore not P. Okay, so what does premise one say? Premise one says, if we live in Toronto, then we live in Ontario. So it tells us about the, the relationship between Toronto and Ontario. The relationship I'm drawing here is a kind of containment relationship, which basically shows us that there's Ontario that's not Toronto, but there's no Toronto that's not Ontario. So if we live in Toronto, then we necessarily live in Ontario. But it says here, we don't live in Ontario. We're way out here. I don't know where we are. Therefore, we don't live in Toronto. Valid? Follows inescapably? Absolutely. Could it be sound? Well, it depends who this is, whether it's true or false. But the form of the argument modus tollens is truth preserving. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion is also true. Okay. Um, here, this next one I made when I was making supper yesterday. <laughs> okay. If I make sloppy joes, then my family is happy. So if I made them, they are happy. This is guaranteed. Premise two, they are not happy. Therefore, I didn't make sloppy joes. Why? Because if I did, they would be happy. Now keep in mind, other things make them happy, but premise one tells us sloppy joes necessarily do. And if they're not, you can certainly conclude I didn't make them. Okay. Now, things start to get more interesting when we get into the invalid deductive forms. First, we have denying the antecedent. So I like to think of this as a kind of um, like messed up modus ponens, the bad, <laughs> bad modus ponens, okay? So denying the antecedent, why is it wrong? Okay, if Nancy goes to the party, then Sid goes to the party. We know this, right? Nancy didn't go, not P. Can you derive from that that Sid didn't go? No. Why? Because Sid could go because he heard there's popcorn at the party and he wanted to be there. Um, but we know that if Nancy goes, then Sid goes. But what I'm trying to say is that's not the only condition in which Sid goes. So when we conclude Sid did not go, that is wrong. It's an invalid form. It is a non-truth preserving form. When the premises are P then Q not P, you cannot derive not Q. Because again, it is possible for Q to have to happen independently. Let's look at another example. If I go to university, I will learn philosophy. Sounds good. I didn't go to university, not P. Right? Therefore, not Q. Therefore, I don't learn philosophy. Again, I could learn philosophy on my own. But what I said in premise one was that if I go to university, then I will learn philosophy. It doesn't say the only way I learn philosophy is if I go to university. That's a very different claim. 
So we have to keep in mind that Q is a result of P, but P is not the only way that Q occurs. So that's why denying the antecedent is an invalid deductive form. Affirming the consequent, also a problem. What do we do here? Um, in my view, this is the wrong way up the arrow problem. <laughs> okay, if Nancy goes to the party, Sid goes to the party. All right, Sid goes to the party. So based on, you know, denying the antecedent, we should already see what the problem is here, right? P is the antecedent condition. Q is the consequent of P. So if P happens, Q happens. So affirming Q, which is premise two, affirming Q does not allow us to derive P. So recall um, that Sid going to the party can be independent um, and doesn't um, guarantee how how could you derive Nancy went because Sid did you know it's the other way around um, Nancy could have not gone to the party right if I go to university I will learn philosophy I learned philosophy therefore I went to university again I could have learned philosophy on my own. So we cannot go the wrong way up the arrow based on these premises. So, um, yeah, just um, pay attention to the antecedent and the consequent of that statement and what gets triggered. And, you know, don't go the wrong way up the arrow. <laughs>